All right, folks, welcome back. We are here for the Unofficially Opinionated Podcast. I will be your host today, facilitator. I'm Christian. Uh, we've got Nate and Tim here as usual. And today we've got a special guest with us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the documentary, How to Change Your Mind, also psychedelics. And so with us today is Dr. Matthew Gamble. Uh, sir is a certified Gallup Strengths Coach, which I think is really cool. He holds a doctorate in transformational leadership, which he's very passionate about, and also um, started a company, Magnetize Global, where he does coaching and other things there, as well as many hats this guy has, uh, director of operations at Living Wisdom Church, which is a nonprofit 501c3, and there they hope to kind of help create safe and sacred spaces for healing and growth. So that is Matthew Gamble. In short, thank you for joining us here, sir. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. It's <laughs> it's truly an honor to be awesome. here. You know, yes, it's absolutely. An honor to have you, you know, we, we've kind of crisscrossed paths. We were talking earlier. I recall you actually spoke at I'm pretty sure my high school graduation some 20 years ago, and that's where I first kind of met you um, at Auburn Academy. And then we've kind of crisscrossed kind of since then. We were at university around the same time. Our undergrad, you were in grad. Um, we were, I guess, for a little bit kind of actually co-workers um, when you were kind of a minister. I was working kind of the, the finance office out there. Um, you did something out here at a church that I attended uh, maybe 10 years ago or so. And so we kind of crisscrossed paths here and there. Um, when we started this podcast and we we're thinking about different topics, um, I thought, OK, how can I get Matthew on the podcast? What can we talk about? So I saw this documentary. I said, hey, this sounds like the perfect thing to actually discuss. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm very excited. Yes, you yeah, and me I, both. And I gotta say, I, I saw I saw your Clifton Strengths, and it said woo, adaptability, communication, and positivity, and futuristic. I was like, that's really cool. So mine, I did it a while back. Since you're this is your realm, you'll see why I'm like this. I've got input is number one, <laughs> relator, maximizer. Mm -hmm. Then I've got strategic and analytical. So that's what you're going to be dealing with today, Matthew. I, I like all the information. I like all the inputs. <laughs> I like to bring it all in. So uh, that's where we're at. So. Love it. Glad you came with us today. Love it. Love it. All right, guys. So the Thank topic you. today is psychedelics. So I looked up kind of, yeah. there's all kinds of definitions about what a psychedelic is. So I forget where I found this one, but it said it's a drug or a group of substances that change or enhance sensory perceptions, thought processes, and energy levels, um, and sometimes used to facilitate spiritual experiences. So I guess, Matthew, in, in your journey, how would you define kind of what a psychedelic is and, and, and what it does? Uh, well, for starters, a little bit of backdrop with the word psychedelic in, in the sixties, it, that word psychedelic got a very bad rap. Uh, there was a yeah. professor at Harvard university. Uh, his name was Dr. Timothy Leary. And Nixon at the time declared Larry uh, the most dangerous man on the planet or in the United States for his advocacy of psychedelics, specifically using LSD. And I'm very grateful that in 1979, a group of scientists actually uh, created a new word to replace the word psychedelic again. Because by then you've got the war on drugs, psychedelics were, you know, a lot of people just when they thought of the word psychedelic, thought of hippies, thought of people losing their mind or going crazy. There was all this negative connotation. And in 1979, this group of scientists said, well, wait a second, actually these compounds are, are awakening something within the human experience. It's awakening, awakening these, these psychedelic compounds or these experiences are, are giving people, as you said in that definition at the end there, spiritual experiences. So they coined this phrase entheogen. And what entheogen means literally is the God within. And so the way I would define psychedelics, and I do prefer the word entheogen, it's what we use primarily at Living Wisdom when referring to these sacraments, uh, sacred medicines, uh, I would refer to them or the psychedelic or entheogenic experience as unlocking the God within or the spirit molecule, for instance, and we'll get into that in a little bit um, of more specifically what that means, but definitely unlocking spiritual 
experiences or the divine within you. Awesome. And Theogen. All right. I, I will aim to use the more current uh, terminology. It, it is interesting how how simply a, well, a, a word well, over how time can take on this connotation that yeah. whether positive or negative, right? But, uh, for sure. So Entheogen is E-N-T-H-E-O-G-E-N. And if you, like, as a pastor, I was studying theology. Mm -hmm. So theology is the study of God. Entheogen is, again, it's using that word theo, uh, standing for God, or theos um, in the Greek. And, and yes, again, just focusing on the spiritual aspect. And don't get me wrong. I mean, psychedelics is fine. We can use that word interchangeably. It's just, again, it can have a lot of negative connotation and for right reason. I mean, these medicines are can be extremely powerful and if taken or ingested in the wrong way or in the wrong set and setting, which is often uh, referred to as being an important part of ingesting these Absolutely. medicines, I refer to them as medicines, um, it can result in a very chaotic experience, a very uh uh psychologically disturbing experience and often often does for, including myself um but that's where the set and setting where you know what is your set what is your mindset ingesting these things so a lot of people are turning to these medicines and that's part of what i'm passionate about you know for hopping on podcasts like this is that a lot of people are turning to these medicines, these allies, but they don't have the background and they're ingesting them in set and mindsets and in settings that are not conducive uh, for their journey. And it can be extremely scary. It can awaken psychosis um, and have all types of negative implications. Uh, but when done in a healthy setting and with good intentions set ahead of time, these medicines can provide literally ineffable experiences beyond description, um, while at the same time helping an individual. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and put this out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a Christian pastor, where I was left questioning and wondering what the hell is going wrong with, with me, or you know, I'm I'm devoting my life to Jesus. I'm showing up at church every week. I'm preaching my guts out. I'm studying the Bible. I'm eating communion. I'm I'm fasting. I'm praying. I'm I'm doing all the things, but I'm not experiencing inner transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so at the core of my being, you know, I was longing for a transformational experience of biblical proportion. And I believe any Christian is entitled to that. It's what's presented in the Bible. Uh, the Bible repeatedly tells us that we should have experiences with God that are very living, that are very transformative. And yet, and this is no offense to those who are plugging into church and are experiencing God in transformative ways, but for for it took me a couple decades. I converted at 21 into Christianity from atheism, and that's a story in and of itself. And my story just preceded me. My conversion story preceded me and just set me on this path of, of being this evangelist. And two decades, over two decades later, as a senior pastor just down the road from where I'm seated right now, I just realized man, I'm not experiencing what I'm reading in scripture. I'm proclaiming it with all I have. I'm believing it with all I have, but it's, you know, I'm, you know, what have you done for me lately? And then simultaneously, I came across a TED talk from Dr. Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins University, where at the time they had been studying the efficacy of psilocybin. And I will take a breath here in just a moment. <laughs> but they were studying the <laughs> efficacy of psilocybin uh, to treat depression, anxiety, PTSD, end of life trauma, and addiction mm. issues. And arguably I was dealing with two or three out of those five and not feeling the power of God or Jesus or Holy Spirit. And Johns Hopkins is treating people with one psilocybin uh, journey in a clinical setting, again, a nice, safe, set and setting 
at, with unprecedented results in all, all five of those areas. And as their studies now well over two decades have they been studying it, they're finding other categories uh, where these, these natural plant allies compounds are providing people with transformative healing. And ultimately, I believe as a human being, we deserve it. Absolutely. You know, for, uh, yeah, I, I, I know Nate agrees. So, so for us, you know, I think my, my first entry to, into any of this really was this Netflix documentary um, by Michael Pollan, right? Um, now, he, he's a professor of science and, and environmental journalism. Where I really first saw him was watching the Food Inc. documentary, like, back in 08. And I was, at that time, watching a lot of those types of things, just getting, you know, just looking at food and health and kind of, you know, just kind of seeing how it's, yeah, just Freaked right, like, freedom, like, like how it became so industrialized <laughs> and a lot of, just a lot of the greed and kind of yeah. corporate nature and governmental oversight that was kind of seeping into it, right? And so that time, you know, from that perspective, the Food Inc. thing, it kind of changed how I looked at food. I mean, I didn't radicalize my whole life. I'm not out there, you know, growing my own stuff, but it definitely did change how I viewed food, how I viewed kind of official proclamations about food and which ones are healthy and what is not and all of that, right? And so, you know, having seen him, you know, involved in that, I didn't even realize he was involved in this documentary until I turned it on. <laughs> so so I I turned it on and I was like, wait a minute, I recognize that guy. Like I've seen him before. And so just kind of seeing his progression from kind of He's always been about plants and nature and how he progressed kind of from food over into the medicine piece. Um, specifically, this documentary just go, goes yeah. into LSD in one episode, psilocybin, um, MD, MDMA, which also known as ecstasy on the streets, and then, all, yeah. and then ended with mescaline um, in, in general, but also looking at um, peyote and the, um, the other cactus. What was it called? Yes. Watch yeah. Uh, yes. So, yeah. okay. Yeah, I'll like, say, is, really, so the, Nate, the, the question is for, I guess, for you, also you and Tim is, you know, for you guys, what was your kind of thoughts around ethnogenic plants and other things um, in, in this realm <laughs> kind of before you watched the documentary? Kind of where, where were you coming from? Yeah, for me, like I was not, <clears throat> excuse me, I did not hold uh, um, psychedelics in high regard. <laughs> <laughs> to be absolutely honest, honest, just because that's what's been preached. When I say preached, I mean, that's what's been taught and, you know, whatever. Uh, so, and I don't like not being in control. I, I, I'm not a control freak, but I don't like be like, for example, I don't like feeling addicted to something because I don't like the feeling that that's what's controlling me. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? So I think I have almost a kind of, anti-addiction uh, <laughs> mentality but i think that there's other things I, I i suffer from from severe depression uh yeah. and i've been working on that for i think going on uh wait let me see going on 16 16 years i think it's been uh, i've been actively working on that or whatever but yeah i didn't when i first found out it so chris was like yeah uh, let's watch this uh this netflix, <laughs> netflix series I was like, oh, God, please don't let it be boring. Because like, like, it's a documentary. And so I was just like, I don't generally get into that. But like immediately from the first episode, my husband had already already watched it. And so I told him about it. He was like, oh, yeah, I saw that. He was like, yeah. But I started watching it. And then I was like, oh, my, I couldn't stop. Like I just went through all four uh, episodes just like that. It was, And I was like, maybe it's true that I have learned the contrary, I, that's very easy for them to do. If they decide that this is not, uh, you know, we had dare in, in class in, sc right. in school, you know, uh, drug abuse resistance education. Yes. Yeah, he, I still remember that. Like we, we had that. So like they were actively telling us to go, you know, not to use our brains and stuff like that, like this, that there's no question about it, you know, sort of thing. So yeah, I was I yeah. was intrigued. How about <laughs> you, Tim? I guess where were you kind of coming from before you kind of watched the documentary? So I actually I'm in the same sense as Nate. Like I I don't like the idea of losing one control of you know you know I I don't I don't that's one of my things I I don't like that um and uh, I did I also grew up you know with the whole and dare that was ingrained in me um like strongly so 
when um I when I used to hear about people, you know, like, you know, taking these types of things, you know, the the idea of those mental trips, you know, like from the sixties and stuff, and people just, you know, that's how it came to me. That was the imagery I saw in my head. Tie dye shirts and that's sweat. true, right? I, <laughs> Plus so. also like our backgrounds, you know, like you know, I, I don't know, Chris, if you had this thing, but you know, Tim and I came from backgrounds where there were we had a lot of drugs in our, you know, a lot of drugs uh, around us, you know, uh, like, you know, we had weed and stuff like that. And I saw how the, and it would crack and all this other stuff. So, you know, I basically just grouped everything together. Just like, I don't want to be yeah. like that. So, yeah. Bye. Yeah. I mean, I mean, for me, it, it wasn't really a drug, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, like my grandfather was an alcoholic. Um, you know, a lot of my, bro- my, my, my father's brothers struggled with that. Right. And so that was kind of from a young age, like, you know, it was kind of like, you know, is that in me, you know, just to, and already I have kind of an addictive personality, just about anything that I really get into. Right. And my father's the same way. We, we, we kind of like that. Like we, if we, if we're into something, then it's very easy to kind of flip that switch and like, now I'm like, this is, this is what I do now. Right. So, but it's interesting. You guys mentioned the, the piece about not wanting to kind of lose control. That's never really concerned me. I'm just, I'm such a rule follower that that's, that, that's my piece, right? Like, like for me, like, oh. I'm such a rule follower. <laughs> like, I'm not ever in any place where I can simply get access to this random things and then go do them just because that's just not who I'm rolling with. But if, if, if I were to have some safe place that I didn't think I would go out and, like, hurt myself, right, I, I probably wouldn't be opposed to a lot of different things, given that if they were legal. I'm just so much of a rule follower that I'm like... I'm just not trying to get into any trouble. So I just avoided a lot of things for the most part for that reason. Um, But yeah, I mean, yeah, I think after seeing the documentary and and again, you know, any documentary has its own kind of biases and angle and the way they present things. But for me, it just, it just reinforced the idea of, again, thinking back to food Inc around um, really how, governments kind of make decisions kind of snap decisions and how those things kind of just perpetuate right and it's never revisited or analyzed or or looked at in any way and even and even so uh matthew maybe you can speak to this but like even when we i don't know how much resistance people would get back from even being re-educated but in the opposite way you know for example if i took this and i told you know, like, for example, if I told my mom, I'm pretty sure she'd be like, no, <laughs> no, that's just, you know, regardless of sort the of devil. thing, because, yeah, yeah, basically sort of thing, regardless of whether you're like, oh, this is better, this is more, um, th- this is positive, maybe they'd be like, oh, this is, um, what do you call that, uh, you know, hedonism, or they're just trying to turn it into mm-hmm. something that, I don't know, do you have that type of pushback from people when, uh, I guess, like, trying to re-educate them about, uh the positivities of <laughs> are you yeah. asking me yeah i'm asking is it because i could see yeah, that kind of thing well i there's a number of things y'all have presented just now that i would i would love to hit on that really ties yeah, into that ahead. question so this notion of of you know not wanting to lose control i would really challenge you to consider that your whole life has been filled with programming that has absolutely forced you unbeknownst to yourself into a a out of control state where you are completely at the mercy of what you have been told is right and wrong um furthermore on the front end of this conversation when we were getting our sound and everything balanced you guys were talking about these movies that you want to go see (laughs) and when you go and watch a movie it's going to impact your brain Um, And arguably, you're going to be out of control out of your emotions or how it's going to impact you or there's going to be things that you're going to see that you weren't planning on seeing. And all of those things have an impact. Furthermore, uh, it is said on a conservative level that our thoughts and our our actions are 90% driven by our subconscious. Uh, on a conservative level, some stats say as high as 98% of our thoughts and actions are driven by our subconscious. So as we're going through this human experience, we are fed with all these rules and regulations that you did not choose. 
And so I would actually argue that you, you may not want to lose control, but that you're dealing with things like being in depression or being in an addic addictive personality, that the human experience is really one that's, com that's arguably out of our control, especially if 98 or 90% of our lives or of our thoughts and actions are driven by our subconscious. And back to the question about about how when people are coming to me and and quite frankly this is part of it you know evidence for me of you guys reaching out like this um of asking me to be on this podcast two of you identifying as as christian and and uh one of you in an exploratory stage yes i have a number of people especially in the recent months since this documentary has come out i've been public about my journey over the last especially over the last several years uh using these medicines and what's so sad to me is that uh well number one i was married to a person i went through a divorce after 17 and a half years but I was married to a person who did not want to lose control and hates the thought of losing control or being in an environment where she's out of control. And I, to me, it's just a complete misnomer. And I would really, really challenge it. And at the same time, I have tremendous compassion because so many people are of the individuals that are reaching out, including Seventh-day Adventist pastors who are troubled with depression and anxiety and nothing is working for them. And they're seeing documentaries like this, but then they're saying, well, the legality issue or the church has taught me this is of the devil, this is devil's work, or the, you know, back to the legality, the government has said that this is wrong. I've always been taught that this is wrong. And I would actually say that these medicines, instead of looking at it as an opportunity of, of losing your mind, it's actually helping you. I mean, psilocybin is statistic or scientifically proven to heal your brain. So I would actually argue, and it's sad. It's sad. I get it. I get the mentality, uh, but it's to me, it's just indicative of an individual being stuck and in, in their programming. And when they, when they, when the trials get tough enough, and their pain gets difficult enough. And they can look themselves in the mirror and say, you know what, what I'm doing is actually not working for me. Like this is not actually healing me. It's not actually working for me. And then they get to a place when they're more receptive. And when they're receptive, then possibly they're willing to step into a safe and sacred space where what's going to happen is, yeah, there's, they're going to, they're, they're going to be out of control. There's going to be parts that are out of control, but what, in that out of control state or stepping into that void, they're also going to be w awakening pieces of them that potentially have been dormant, that they have not given attention to for their entire lives. So that's why I love the, the name of this title of the, the documentary series based on Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. Look, if you're, if you're thinking your mind needs some changing, you're probably right. There's a good argument for that. And, um, if you think you're in control, I would suggest, suggest that you're probably kidding yourself <laughs> and, and give yourself right. some freedom, you know, to step in and, and acknowledge or, or be, be curious with yourself and say, okay, how duped am I? If I think that I'm in full control, just how duped am I with that? Or what, what areas of my life do I think I'm in control that I'm really not? Um, because that may give you some impetus or some freedom to open up and be, be open or more curious to, to things that could really serve you well. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you had mentioned the part, sorry, I don't want to hug. So y'all, you know, cut me off. If... All good, Nate. All good. <laughs> Cause y'all know how I do, you know how I do. So <laughs> you mentioned the part about the set in, uh, and setting, so psilocybin is also known on the street as um, magic mushroom, right? So I have friends who actually use magic uh, mushrooms. And I, after, while I was watching this, um, this series, I was wondering, actually, I was kind of 
like juggling between, like I said, I, I, I struggle with um, depression. Um, I'm on actually uh, ashwagandha. <laughs> My mom actually told me about it um, to kind of help stabilize. I was using St. John's work, but it didn't work mm -hmm. for me. Um, so I started using ashwagandha and it's been better, but I don't want to continuously use a product. Like I, I feel like that's beyond my ability or whatever. So I was hesitating between LSD and uh, psilocybin. But anyways, um, I was talking to a friend about it who does do magical mushrooms and he, he does it not often, often, but he does it maybe two or three times a year, you know, sort of thing. Um, and I wanted it as I was watching, this is really, this is one of the reasons why I really liked the the series is because they were talking about therapeutic, you know, using it therapeutically, right? So they had, they had um, cases where, you know, people come in, they had this nice setting, the person knew what they wanted. So I think one of them came in with severe OCD, I, I, I think it was, um, and they they with the one dose i think it was with one dose what one um one 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 what do you like call a that? session one. or an experience help yeah. me out here mm -hmm. one session thank you <laughs> with one session like you know it didn't start it didn't happen immediately but he was saying that over the course of uh you know little by little he noticed that he was no longer you know being OCD about certain things and uh, and stuff like that, and he knew he it, it he was afraid that it would come back, and then he got to this point when he knew it wasn't going to come back, and that's like really what spoke to me because I was like, that's that's it, like that's you know. So when I was talking to my friend about it, I was like, I don't want to just use it. I don't because you know you can go to Amsterdam just buy it, but I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to be in a setting where this is therapeutical where. I'm telling you, you what I want to accomplish. And it's not just depression. I feel like if I take one of these things in the right setting, I, I feel like this is what I told God. I feel like I would unlock my brain. Uh, I don't know what that means, but I feel it. <laughs> so, so anyways, yeah, that's, that's, that's why that was very interesting for me. That, uh, that set in setting, I think it's, it's important. Yeah. Um, especially with myself, like, you know, growing up the way I did, I seen a lot of people on a lot of different things. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so that idea that, so that's where I get that idea of losing control. <laughs> um, because I've seen it, you know, um, and there's nothing fun about it, maybe to them, but there's no, at it, there's first maybe, but it. then afterwards, yeah, it's like, hilarious. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but after now, you know, so. So that that's where I got that idea of losing control, and I and I understand that you know like, you know that we don't have a lot of control of, about the things that are, that goes on around us and what we're influenced by all the time. So I guess it's not the kind of control I'm talking about. I mean, just the idea that when when I you know that I can't take the reins when I want, or at least feel like I can't take the reins when I want, you know. Yeah. That's the control I'm talking about. I know that I really don't really have all that type of control about everything that goes on around me. But no, because uh, you you know we were talking about re religion, and you were like mm -hmm. still kind of hesitating with your you know religious thoughts, which shows. I mean, I, we had this episode where I was talking about how I felt like religion was brainwashing. Uh, yes. You know, Steve disagreed, but I just felt like that was one of the, that was one of the cases. We don't have a lot of. I found myself thinking when I'm doing stuff, even though I'm far removed from our religion, uh, I found myself thinking things that I wouldn't think normally had I not been brought up in that yeah. religion, mm -hmm. you know, um, for example, which day we're going to keep for the day of rest, right. you know, sort of thing. Like, yeah. I you so know, bad sometimes. A, 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 a <laughs> example of, of that day was, you know, Matthew, when you had that church back in Seattle, right? Um, I, I had recently graduated, graduated from, from college, come home, came home, was looking for some place to go. Now, in myself personally, I don't think I'm very conservative, right? I, I don't, I don't care about rings and jewelry and all kinds of stuff. Like, I don't care. Like, I, I'm past that. But at the same time, for a while there in this transition from kind of what I was taught to what I was to living what I truly believed, 
I would go to a church, someone had jewelry on, and it would bother me. Even though mentally, I, I know I don't have a problem with it. It was like an internal reaction. I remember going, 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 to, the, going to the church and there was coffee, right? Like those kind of things, right? I don't have an issue with coffee. I don't, have the, I don't care if there's coffee in church, but it, like it would, it, at, that, at that time, like it, would, it was still bothering me. Like years later, like some, I don't know, 12 years later now, my church, they have a whole coffee bar. You can go to and get coffee, hot chocolate, whatever. And it's so normal to me. And I don't think about it. And I don't, I actually literally don't care anymore. But it took a lot of time to get from my head doesn't care and my head believes certain things now to my internal, even physical gut reactions to things now kind of more aligns with where I am mentally. Um, and so I, I think some of that is is kind of happening currently right now with this whole topic for me is, you know, what I was taught about these plants and things, right, versus now what I'm moving to believe and slowly kind of figuring out kind of how to get those things aligned. Well, Chris, we actually shared what we thought. What what did you think about it though? Myself? The, yeah. Yeah, well, well the, the, the series, series, you know, yeah. for, for me, I I'm all I'm always I become more skeptical of documentaries just over time. Just I think as a protection mechanism, just period, just because, you know, there's always some agenda, right? And you can't just say, oh, documentary means all truth. Let me suck it in and go away and believe it, right? Because mm -hmm. there's all kind of things out there. But for, for, for me, I've really come to a different place with it. And what really struck me were, were two things. One was like the whole idea of set and setting, right? As you mentioned, Matthew, like I think for a lot of things that because that's very important into kind of having a responsible experience. It, it can even be music. Right. Like it, it, imagine how even a particular type of beat or rhythm, like the set and setting matter. Right. If I can I can have a certain beat in church and have a certain experience, you put me in a club, strobe lights and different situation and I'm having a very different experience. It could be the exact same beat and music. Right. And I think in a, to that point, you know, a lot of times certain music has been demonized because of its use in a set and setting, you know, whole African music itself has kind of been demonized in a lot of ways, right? Because it's viewed in a certain way, but I think it's back to a, a similar kind of set and setting issue. And, and also at the same time, you know, looking at just, I didn't realize even what a schedule one substance was, right? You know, to me, I didn't realize you're declaring it has zero medical purpose, which to me, that, that idea, would have never sat well with me had I really dove into that kind of earlier on. So for me, the documentary looking at, okay, they said this X, Y, Z substance is now has no medical purpose, period. It had me thinking, really? When I think about all the medications we have out there that are used and you, even, even the ones that, that, yeah, yeah all and, based and, on but plants. even the common ones on TV, right? All these side effects, right? Like including death, depression, yeah. suicide, like all this stuff on top of all the opiates that are used, which the companies are going to getting sued about. <laughs> right but all these opioids that are used they use those in a medical environment right because they found a purpose for it in a controlled way um but these other things it's still this stigma that it's like well those can never be used medically because we said so like 50 years ago and so that that's really the part of the documentary kind of what kind of changed my mind you know i think it's, it's a double meaning right <laughs> is is looking at things as far as you know how can it be used appropriately and for what um, and then, you know, those things, I, I feel like, you know, if we, if there's a use for it in, in a sp specific way, why should that be illegal? Um, so that's, that's kind of where I kind of led to after kind of watching the, the documentary. But, okay. I, don't know, I guess, I guess, Matthew, for you, you know, having kind of been on the journey already before the documentary, did anything about the documentary itself kind of hit you in a certain way or strike you or even maybe give you hope in, 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 in some ways? Well, and before you before you answer that question, I also because I was re I was reading on your website, um, you ha you had mentioned that you had um, you were. I think you were addicted, right? You had uh, some addictions. Is that correct? Um, sorry, I was trying to bring up your page now. So <laughs> but um, yeah, and you had actually already just mentioned that you were suffering with like two or three. I, I would like to know also, like, how did these uh, 
psychedelics or let's see in entheogens entheogens thank you yeah i'm gonna, work <laughs> on it. I'm gonna get it i'm gonna get it how, how they actually helped you personally because i'm theorizing here but you have an actual example experience exactly sure and and just right off the bat i'll i'll let you know um that number one i was elated with that documentary that it came out it launched in uh, july 12 of this year and uh my partner and i we did we actually did a four-part series uh doing a live uh on zoom um uh fielding question and answers for the general public uh about each each episode um i found the episodes to be a little bit disjointed a little that i mean if i want to be critical about it i could be critical about certain things about how it was done but overall i was just so elated and then when it launched it was trending in the top five on netflix and it just served as greater impetus, I think, for more people to get on board, as you're all testifying, right? You didn't know about it or you hadn't thought about it. And then you watch this documentary. I had read the book, How to Change Your Mind, which I think is far better than the documentary. Um, and goes into much more detail over psychedelics and theogens, the history of psychedelics and theogens, especially in this nation in just brilliant fashion. I just adore Michael Pollan for his bravery and his willingness to to dive in and try these substances himself. And unfortunately for me, back to the question of how these have impacted me, I am not a one and done. Uh, so when I saw that OCD guy, I mean, I was elated for him. And that testimony was just incredible. Or, or the woman that the the uh, I think she was a Catholic lady later in later in age had a terminal disease and no longer feared death after one treatment. Um, I was just so elated. Shared it with my mom. My parents are, are both Catholic, and you know, in hopes that it would it would change their mind or give them some insight into what I'm doing. I have not been a one and done. I actually speaking of Amsterdam. I was speaking in Denmark in the last year of me pastoring. I was speaking at a, a uh, Seventh-day Adventist camp meeting in Denmark and had heard that documentary from Dr. Roland Griffiths, which I would definitely recommend having in your notes uh, for, mm -hmm. for listeners that they could click on and happy to provide that. It's easy to find. Um, but having heard that documentary and the efficacy of psilocybin diving into it that year, and then realizing that in Amsterdam, they're actually legal. I booked a 48 hour on the tail end of that Denmark speaking appointment and, and went and had a, took my own journey with psilocybin, which just so you're clear, I had worked with those allies, uh, psilocybin, cannabis and LSD in high school and up to the age of 19, uh, but then hadn't touched them in over well over two decades. Um, not not cannabis uh, cannabis was sporadically throughout and then towards the end of my ministry was I, I turned to it as opposed to pharmaceuticals for my mental health um and my journey in amsterdam it was just solo i didn't tell my my then wife that was part of the dissolve of the marriage was you know there were aspects of my life that i was stepping into and feeling drawn to that she just could not could not support and in that desire for control as well, in part, I'm not trying to blame it all on this, but in that desire for control, seeing me head down this path brought up a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety for her. Uh, but you know, the, the journey in Amsterdam, it was incredible, uh, but it wasn't all that I was looking for, but it did set me on a path and I won't go into the whole story unless you want me to, but I, I then ended up uh, that that was the catalyst for me to to realize I need to resign. I can no longer keep pastoring. Um, I want to turn to this path and journey. And then that resulted in the dissolve of my marriage. Um, and I started on this journey of of I was. You know, when, when I will say this on, on the spiritual realm, I find that as people are calling these allies into their lives, that they have an incredible way of getting in touch with you at the right time. 
Um, I'm not saying it works that way for everybody, but it, it certainly did for me. So I was able to access psilocybin. Um, it, the, the specific strain that Terrence McKenna speaks of uh, quite a bit may shock you. It's called penis envy, but it's one of the higher concentrated psilocybin um, strains that are available. There's, I think there's a couple hundred strains of psilocybin that are available. But I started working with that, that strain of medicine. I would weigh it out. Uh, so I was doing it calculated, but I was also doing it alone because I didn't have anybody. I didn't right. know anybody um, yeah. that was wanting to support me or, or I was really in a, in a stage of a season of a lot of loneliness, solitude and desperation. Uh, but I started working with it um, with, with, with significant intention. You know, I'd plan it. I would fast, I would prepare. That day in Amsterdam, I got on my knees and opened my Bible and read John three and four before ingesting the medicine. So it was, it was the, the setting, the intention was there. Um, but for me, my journey has not been a one and done. But I will tell you today that, you know, I resigned in 2017. I really started working with the medicines in 2019 with a high level of, of consistency. In 2020 is when I met my partner, Amanda, who um, we, we, she is a medicine woman, has her medicine uh, ordination through uh, Medicine Path Native American Church. And, and we work together in ceremonial settings yesterday. As a matter of fact, just before getting on here, we had guests leaving who were here overnight. So every first and, and third Saturday of the month, we host uh, ceremonies with entheogens in a safe and sacred way where people have to apply. They, there's a whole process for it. Uh, but we are creating a... Our, you know, our mission, as was alluded to on the front end here, is to create a safe and sacred space for our diverse community to learn, heal, and grow together. And we just believe so heavily that these medicines are healing people. And for myself, um, I would present a couple things. My, my addiction or what I was labeled an, as an addict and and i could go off on that whole uh, label and the i was in 12 steps for a big part of my my adult life i uh, was a sex addict i was addicted to pornography and masturbation and unfortunately looking back on it now in my life i was never taught the sacred nature of sexuality and how to treat my penis with with sacredness and see it as the incredible gift that it is and what these medicines have done not just in my awareness of of the sacredness of my penis and and sacred sexuality but what these medicines have done is arguably awakened elements of my subconscious that were completely dormant that i was completely out of touch with that i was completely unaware of and they've awakened parts of my life where now instead of being asleep at the wheel and just drifting through life thinking that I had a lot mm -hmm. in control, thinking that I had the truth with a capital T, thinking that I knew what was going to happen the next day. And all, all of these, you know, pre-programmed notions, uh, these medicines have just awakened a deep love for myself. In the not too distant past, I was, I was taking uh, ayahuasca, which you may have heard of. Unfortunately, they did not address ayahuasca in the documentary. It is addressed in the book. Um, but ayahuasca at the, the core compound that you're dealing with, with ayahuasca, which is very popular these days, people are running to the it Amazon, cute, my part. Right? Yeah, often, not, not always, yeah? but oh, often, okay. but, but, but the beauty, and this is, this is, again, this would be a great case in point. Thank you for mentioning the puke word. <laughs> so when you get when you get into these medicines, so bless your heart for growing up in Seattle and Capitol Hill and seeing crack addicts and people completely out of their minds on different drugs and and dealing with all types of mental health. One of the largest homeless populations on the planet you know, or in the nation anyway, is there in Seattle. And so you're seeing a tremendous amount of dysfunction. And if that's the mental image that you're thinking or if you're thinking about somebody's taking this medicine and it's going to make them puke, the the beauty of the puking 
which we actually refer to as getting well. And in our ceremonies, every participant is g given a bucket. They don't, they don't keep it, but they are provided a bucket for that purpose because purging is actually with these medicines when they come into your body. I mean, think about it. Mycelia mushrooms are covering the entire earth. And in these medicines, when you ingest them, they come in and start awakening parts of you and parts of you need to come out. Parts of you need purging. Parts of you need removing. And so the, the purging or the puking, as you refer it to, is actually a getting well where we will often celebrate it um, uh, with various words of celebration. Or, and we always presence it on the front end of our ceremonies that, listen, in our society, when somebody is vomiting, you're like, oh, my God, this is gross. It could be it could trigger a response where you're everybody's right. throwing up. We've seen movies with that happening. But in this setting, we actually help reframe people to see that the medicine is doing its work and is clearing things out that need to be removed. And I promise you, uh, God willing, each one of you, I'm not advocating that you do it unless you're called to it. I'm a huge advocate that you do do it so long <laughs> as you're called to it. Um, but when you purge and have that cleansing experience, I can promise you this much, you will be extremely grateful. It's painful, it's difficult, it's challenging. The Buddha taught that, that this world, this human experience is suffering. Uh, Jesus would, I would argue that Jesus experienced quite a bit of suffering on this planet. I think if we were to go down the line that every human being that's here on this podcast here now, and anybody that's going to listen to it is dealing with suffering. And what you're longing for is healing. And unfortunately, as government is realizing now, we screwed up. We made a huge mistake. This war on drugs is completely ineffective. And not only that, but we took allies that, could, that are now showing the mental health, all of psychiatry, psychology, and pharmaceutical companies are speechless at the efficacy of this natural plant that the government made illegal. Maybe you've seen the meme Western where world. Jesus, where Jesus is, is, has this like look on his face. They took a picture of some, you know, artist depiction of Jesus with this, you know, skewed image of his face. And the, the meme is saying, you know, God made these psychedelic plants government made them illegal and jesus <laughs> right. is like you I've know what that. the heck and and before i forget too there is another great book that just came out this this year called the immortality key that if you're open to it it will totally unpack for you and speaking of seventh day adventists it will totally unravel the fabric of adventism that presently not to digress but just to get this off <laughs> my chest the Adventist church is spending millions and millions and millions of dollars to debate whether a human with a vagina can be a minister or not. Oh, millions of, do of dollars on, on this. I'm not trying to go down this path. <laughs> um, uh, but just to, to presence for you, in the immortality key, not only did this non-psychedelic using individual, he's a PhD linguist, uh, I, I, his name's, I believe, Michael, and his last name is, is hard for me to pronounce. But, um, but in this book, he tracks and discovers that the original Eucharist that the Christians were taking, that the original spiritual people were taking, was psychedelic in nature, had the psychedelic compound called ergot. And that these people were ingesting and having these experiences. And when you look at people like Moses at the burning bush, which some scholars really believe is the acacia plant that was on fire. And acacia just happens to be one plant on this planet that, like your body, has DMT, the spirit compound in it. The acacia plant has a large uh, amount of DMT in it. And they believe, some scholars believe, that Moses was having a DMT-awakened experience. 
or as Jesus takes the disciples and has this this transfiguration experience and we all think that that just was that was normal for them you know that was this normal occurrence for and granted it blew their minds uh but could it be that entheogens were being used and if you go down this rabbit hole if you choose to and it's only coming i mean i'm i stand here sit here right now with tremendous amount of joy because the momentum is just coming and building and i believe that these plants are just coming to the rescue of humanity because arguably humanity is going to hell in a handbasket <laughs> thinking that we have it all in control, believing that we don't want to lose our minds. And reckon, and for some of us, we're waking up to the fact that, dang, the, the pill I swallowed is not all that it's cracked up to be. And I believe more and more Christians and are recognizing that Christianity is just simply a paradigm. All religions are, are and this is another <laughs> rabbit trail i won't try to go on it too hard but it's just simply a paradigm and when you step out of for me when i stepped out of adventism i liken it metaphorically to a a warehouse a christianity warehouse and in the christianity warehouse you have all these shoe boxes of of denominations and when i jumped out of the adventist shoe box and i'm like okay i'm a christian now but then at some point I, I walked out of the, the, the warehouse and I stood outside of the Christian warehouse and looked down warehouse row and realized there's all these religions out here, but God is so much bigger. And what these plants are doing for the human race, again, done in a certain setting that's sacred. And in our, our understanding, the sacred setting that we offer has the greater efficacy than even the clinical setting. Uh, if the clinical setting calls to you, we fully support it. God bless you. I covet. I would love to try it myself. It hasn't happened for me. Uh, but the spiritual setting is just uh, mind blowing. And again, back to the immortality key. He unpacks the role of women in the early church that the Roman oppressed and that the Christian Bible that you read uh, supports this men only. Uh, that the Adventists are duped and debating till Jesus comes back, <laughs> uh, just going to hell in a handbasket, thinking they're they're fighting fighting the good fight, uh, spending millions of dollars while people are suffering. Uh, so he supports and discovers the role of women, and then the role of the psychedelic Eucharist. That when people were coming into the church setting they were actually having a psychedelic experience that was actually giving them an entheogenic and a, an experience with a God within that I can quote all over scripture, God desires for you to have. And I would just, I would just challenge people. Look, if you're having, if, if God is speaking to you and you're and he's touching you and he's healing you, another evidence is this, this is kind of embarrassing to say, but I've bit my nails my whole life. These medicines are healing the anxiety in my nervous system, and I'm no longer biting my That's nails amazing. today. I'm no longer looking at pornography. I'm no longer masturbating like a you know an uncontrolled individual. It's awakening the God within, the divine presence within, the, the very gift that Jesus said. I mean, Jesus said, look, I and the Father are one, and we are going to make our home inside of you which actually means what Jesus was teaching there is that you will become God. That's what he, that's what he's advocating. You're going to do more. You're going to do greater things than you've seen me do. How's that happening? Well, God is coming within. And I would just challenge you, you know, if somebody is sitting in their Christian experience and saying, yeah, I can sing songs. I can drop coin in a bucket. I can hear a good sermon and go home, but my life's not changed then show me tell me about this ocd dude who gave who was willing to put himself in a really difficult situation if you watch yeah. his journey it was not it enjoyable was for him it was yeah. scary as hell yep but we go to church and it's safe it's comfortable while we're dealing with our our nonsense and dysfunction and we just play the freaking role
you know, and we debate on jewelry or coffee <laughs> or vaginas <laughs> and to, to keep us distracted. I'm sorry, to I keep should not be laughing. Distracted, <laughs> I want you to laugh, but to keep yeah. us distracted from the real core issue. And the core issue that breaks my heart is, is humanity is suffering today yeah. in epic proportions. And what breaks my heart is when people do call me up and say to me, I'm so stuck. I wish I could do these things, but they're of the devil. Or, you know, my mom is going to think I'm going to hell in a handbasket. Or I could never do this because of all my upbringing. And one day I just pray. It's just, to me, it's like a snowball effect with everything. And thank God in 2017, I I did not see it at the time. But when I stepped out and resigned with not knowing what I was going to do afterwards, I didn't know what profession I would step into. I was I was unemployed. I ended up homeless. I ended up losing everything. My title, my position, my reputation. And no one calls. No one cares. And I didn't know. It was freaking crazy. I was on the ground in the fetal position multiple times crying, just un, unaware, like, what is going on? And so today I sit here with just a tremendous amount of heart, compassion, passion um, and genuine belief and knowing in my being that no one can take from me, that God is giving me an experience with him that I was longing for in Christianity that modern Christianity could not provide me. So thank you for listening hey, to that absolutely, rant. Mercy. Absolutely. I mean, you are definitely passionate. Like I was listening. I was there. <laughs> I mean, these these two have already heard me like and Chris and I, we talk a lot about what we think like Christianity should should be and what we've been taught it is and uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, I agree. I, I do believe I don't know to what extent because I don't I don't know. I don't know to what extent, but I do know that where I'm I can speak for myself and for what I've seen. I am missing something. I was like, the, just from the way that the Bible reads and or is written, I'm like, you all preach this, you all act like you believe it, but you're not doing it. Like it's not happening. So I don't understand the the disconnect. Like I I, I don't understand. So I, that's why I am no longer in that group in religion because I was like, I, Congratulations. It, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I have to find the right way. And so when I did watch this uh, documentary, I immediately, well, I, started, I, I kept watching it. Then I prayed and I told God, I was like, I think this is what I want. I think I want, and the reason why I wanted it in a therapeutic session is because, well, I have an intention and I just, there's, like I said, I just, feel like it would be unlocking my brain like uh, I don't know like I it's almost like I can see what my brain can do and yet I cannot do it I don't know if that if that makes any sense to any of you all 100% but, like, it but uh, so but the the thing was I was talking to my husband about it I was like so, but I don't know if I want to do if I should do LSD or if I should do um, psilocybin, you know, I was like, I don't psilocybin, psilocybin. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just yeah. messing up all of these technical yeah. words. It's all yeah, good. Like, like, uh, psilocybin, one thing that yeah. really I think struck me about the documentaries, let's start, start specific medicines, was when they're talking about people using the MDMA or ecstasy and they were talking about being able to yeah. talk about sad things and not be sad, right? The, the, the ability to and not be yeah, kind of yeah. go places and 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 work through the thing without without all the baggage of the anxiety and the sadness and all the other stuff kind of getting in the way. Um, you know, like yeah. like I was thinking about you know you know the, the, I think the, the, there was a there's a couple that was talking about how you know they've had a lot of discussions as a couple that way, right? They were able to have <laughs> have the discussion about the thing yeah. without all the additional anxiety and emotion kind of getting in the way. And I was mm-hmm. just imagine being able to really you know, as, as I hear about all these different medicines, you know, a lot of it sounds to me like really just kind of being able to go to the place you need to go to in your brain 
like free of all the baggage, like all the stuff that stacked up, like all, all kind of the things you were taught kind of interfering and really just kind of going to the thing and like meeting it like raw. Right. Which I, I think is kind of a, a very powerful yeah, thing. Yeah. I, the, the one thing I, I will admit that is uh, it, I would still do it, but it is probably something that might be a break to a number of people uh, and would be a break to me if I wasn't so intent on understanding uh, would be the scary part. So like this guy that was suffering with OCD, he saw him, he said, I died. Like he didn't say I saw, my, he, he said specifically, I didn't mm -hmm. see myself died. I actually died. And that's not something people <laughs> <Right>. want to, <laughs> that's not something people want to gener generally experience. Um, and I started thinking about what I would experience. Um, so like for, you know, growing up uh, in the Christian church, I heard all these stories about like, well, obviously the stuff that's in the Bible about casting out demons out of these people. And, you know, I think in one story, he was like, the, the, the man was like rent or something. It was like, it rent him before, you know, it came out or something like that. And I'm like, that, that sounds scary. And then, mm -hmm. you know, Jesus is mm -hmm. talking to these other demons. I don't want to do any of that, you know, sort of thing. It's not, uh, <laughs> that's not something that really, uh, draws my my interest um and i am very avoidant of pain or <laughs> stuff like that so uh that would generally normally be something that prevented me from wanting to to do it but i am so intent on where i believe that i want to be that i'm just like i think it'll be worth it you know, it's not, uh, and well, and I think maybe it might be just temporary. I'm not really sure. Yeah, go ahead. And and Nate, if I can add, my brother, you're you are you are you want to be avoiding of pain, but you're living in pain. You presence today that you you suffer from depression. Oh yeah, yeah. And and it's often you know it's often in this lifetime that we have to go through the pain, you know. Uh, Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. Um, it's often we have to go through the death in order to get to the life. And, and arguably we are all suffering from ego. I thought I was a pretty humble dude when I was a pastor. I love being <laughs> approachable and, and always stood. I was always the last person to leave the church. Always. I mean, I just would stay by. I wanted to be available to people. This season of my life has has helped me go to depths in, in my life and, and watch areas of my life shed off, areas of ego shed off uh, to help create and, and awaken room. I want to congratulate you on using ashwagandha, uh, a natural substance for your mental health. And, and I really do look forward to, because I suspect in your near future, not a prophet here, but I suspect in your near, near, near future, with your openness and your bravery for what you're presencing, that one or the other of these substances would come to you. Um, I, have my, I have some thoughts about that and happy to talk to you off and to anybody. And by the way, I want to make a quick plug that every month my partner Amanda and I are on Zoom to host a free entheogen preparation and integration circle on Zoom, where we get on to just field anybody's answers, um, anybody's questions about entheogenic work. And that's a great place to dive in. And I'm also complete for anybody that's listening to, to completely available. This is my, my life work and, and journey um, at this time, but back to your suffering and avoidance of suffering, you're living in it. And while these things can be very difficult and while purging can occur, it's all for your highest and best. You know, this is why, you know, arguably Jesus modeled for us dying at the age of 33. He didn't have to, uh, but going through this, it's for his highest and best and for the best of humanity. And for you to heal, I would argue this is why we do things like fasting and do spiritual disciplines. This is why we sit in meditation and, and in com uncomfortable places um, 
this is why we face challenges in our life and we're often provided at doorways and we can choose to either keep numbing out and just go down the numb out path or to just go down the brainwash path or, or go down the systems that we've been born and raised in. Or we can say, wait a second, something is fundamentally like there's something I'm aware of something just ain't ain't fully right here. Yeah. And I'm going to I'm going to be open to a, to another way. And I would argue that if it for anybody listening, that if you're looking for some true healing, try doing something for yourself that you've never given yourself permission for, uh, because likely right at right below the surface and that 90 percent. And keep in mind, you have 50 to 50 to 80,000 thoughts running through your noggin every single day, every day. And the majority of them are on loop from the day before. And the majority of those thoughts guiding your actions are guided by your subconscious. And what these medicines are inviting you to do is awaken parts of you, as I said before, that are dormant. And yes, there, there can be pain. There can also be a lot of glory in these psychedelic or entheogenic journeys and trips that people take. It, it can, it, it's the yin and yang uh, you know, of this, this human experience, but ultimately it will birth large healing as long as you are stepping into it in a, in a reverent way, in a respectful way. Um, and even for some people outside of that, it can provide incredible, incredible healings. But I believe in that safe and sacred space or in that clinical setting, um, that you will find yourself some tremendous healing and I really encourage anybody who's considering to, to step out in faith, follow their gut, uh, if it's calling to them. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Dr. Matthew Gamble. I, I don't know that I'll be going down that path necessarily anytime soon, but definitely I'm on the path of learning sure. and being open and, and, and understanding, right. You know, <clears throat> I I've, I, I'm not a clinical therapist, but I, you know I work in IT. But I've been working in the behavioral health field for the past almost ten years. So I've I've kind of seen from the mm. <laughs> the kind of mechanical side how all this works, how many people are going through things, and specifically right now, the last four months, I actually work for a company that does addiction treatment. Um, so we we run mm. rehab centers, we run Beautiful. addiction treatment centers, and outpatient and sober living housing, and really just seeing. Um, you know, the work we're doing, but also seeing how many people keep coming back, right? And and the expense of all of this, right? Like, like I would hope that, you know, I don't think it'll happen, but, you know, the way I see it would, would be, you know, our job would be hopefully to work ourselves out of a job, right? That, you know, we heal enough people that way, they don't really need us anymore, right? But unfortunately, the way a lot of these, a lot of medicines work is that, you know, they help temporarily. And so for me, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to a place where, you know, with these ethnogenic plants and treatments that we get better at really healing people's mind, right? Really getting to the root of it. And so it's yeah. not a continual, you know, relapse and come back and cycle, but really, you know, start healing people. And there's not as much money in that. Um, but I, I think, you know, seeing just, you know, <clears throat> the mental state of, of the world right now, I think we really do need it. Hey, we, we can find other ways to make money. Right. There's always something else that we can go work and fix. Always. But, you know, yeah. in this area, you know, I think as research starts coming back up, right, as these things get taken off of schedule one lists, as we get more research funding into outside of just, you know, getting donations to do funding. Right. As we put the full weight of, you know, maybe NIH behind it at some point to really dig into it, that we can get to a place where it's 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 more common. It's done in a way that's that's less harmful of those out. They're just doing it you know, in any in any way, in any kind of, you know, set and setting, any kind of mental mindset that we can kind of educate people, um, get this out there so people can actually get healed and move forward versus just treating symptoms. So I am yeah. looking forward to that. I, again, thank you, sir, for coming today. I appreciate it. We appreciate yeah, you. you. Um, I know folks can find you at magnetizeglobal.com. That's kind of your your coaching wing. Um, they can schedule a one-hour session to kind of mm -hmm. start off with to see kind of how you can help them with that. Mm -hmm. um, any other kind of things you want to plug or places where, where people can find you? 
Thank you for the magnetizeglobal.com. Great place to connect with me there for individuals or couples work or consulting for businesses. And then uh, livingwisdomchurch.org is our nonprofit 501c3, um, where we, we provide safe and sacred settings, again, for our diverse community to learn, heal, and grow together. I'm on the gram quite a bit these days. I hope that ends at some point <laughs> in my human existence. But for the time being, I am using social media platforms. So on Insta, you can find me at dr.matthewgamble. And I am totally, again, I, I just, if anything resonates or if, you, if somebody is hearing this and wants to disagree, um, I welcome any, any calls, feedback. Uh, I am available for the human race. And I uh, really commend you, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure to be on here today. Uh, thank you so much for having me on. I wish you all the best in, in this journey of unofficially <laughs> opinionated. Uh, I love it. Um, and and I can only, I can only hope there's more that I would just love to share. But um, uh, yeah, so much gratitude for all of you and, and appreciation and hope Absolutely. to be in yeah, touch. I, I suspect we'll have a, a part two of this, Nate, potentially. Um, so, hey, we, we, yeah, we may have you back yeah. again. But, again, thank you for coming. As always, thanks to you, Nate, for <laughs> being our sound editor slash engineer. We appreciate that. Uh, big, big thanks to, uh, to Tim. Try. Tim <laughs> is our, our graphic designer. He does all the, the fun artwork, this logo he did for us. And as you see on YouTube, our thumbnails, that's him as well. Uh, my son, Jaden, does our theme music. So, you know, he's out there. At some point, we'll we'll, we'll get you guys his uh, oh, yeah. his uh, I think soundtrack was where he's on with his music out there. So he's doing that on the backside. But yeah, find us online. Uh, we're Anchor.fm slash unofficially dash opinionated. You go there, you can subscribe directly in Anchor or click any of the other podcast links. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the fun stuff. We're on YouTube, so find us there. We're on all the socials: Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. We're on there. We're not consistently in any given place but we are there if you want to kind of track us down yeah hey come we're there come we're comment there. leave a message <laughs> just look I'll, for I'll us be somewhere reels here pretty soon so it seems like people like those so yeah we're out there so come find us you know like subscribe in your podcast thing um you know on youtube give us a, a, a subscribe there as well but uh we love you guys it's been fun and as always bye tim fun. yes bye tim <laughs>